Good day. In various programmes on this channel, I have said that 2021 will be looked back in future by historians as a decisive year, a potential tipping point in which the geopolitical balance of power between the United States and other countries began to change. We have now just received further news confirming as much, and that is with confirmation that in August, at some point in August, we don't know exactly when, China apparently tested a hypersonic glide vehicle which circled the globe and then approached a target. The test was not completely successful, but it does demonstrate enormous advances in China's military technological capabilities and in a way that affects the geostrategic balance, which has both surprised and alarmed the United States. We have an account of this launch on the front page of the Financial Times, and I will read briefly from the article, though I won't read it all because it is behind a paywall. And the article reads as follows. China tests new space capability with hypersonic missile. Launch in August of nuclear-capable rocket that circled the globe took US intelligence by surprise. China tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile in August that circled the globe before speeding towards its target, demonstrating an advanced capability that caught US intelligence by surprise. Five people familiar with the test said the Chinese military launched a rocket that carried a hypersonic glide vehicle which flew through low orbit space before cruising down towards its target. The missile missed its target by about two dozen miles, according to three people briefed on the intelligence. But two said the test showed that China had made astounding progress on hypersonic weapons and was far more advanced than US officials realised. The test has raised new questions about why the US often underestimated China's military modernisation. We have no idea how they did this, said a fourth person. The US, Russia and China are all developing hypersonic weapons, including glide vehicles that are launched into space on a rocket but orbit the Earth until under their own momentum. They fly at five times the speed of sound, slower than a ballistic missile. But they do not follow the fixed parabolic trajectory of a ballistic missile and are manoeuvrable, making them harder to track. And then the article goes on to say, mounting concern about China's nuclear capabilities comes as China continues to build up its conventional military forces and engages in increasingly assertive military activity near Taiwan. Tensions between the US and China have risen as the Biden administration has taken a tough tack on Beijing. US military officials in recent months have warned about China's growing nuclear capabilities, particularly after the release of satellite imagery that showed it was building more than 200 intercontinental missile silos. China is not bound by any arms control treaty and has been unwilling to engage the United States in talk about its nuclear arsenal and policy. Well, we have to ask ourselves here a number of questions. Firstly, I would point out that there is an actual untruth in this article. Specifically, the article says that the US, Russia and China are all developing hypersonic weapons. Russia isn't just de uh, developing hypersonic weapons, it has actually deployed them. It has actually deployed a hypersonic glide vehicle, somewhat similar by most accounts to the one which China has just tested. Now, that, of course, begs a number of questions about this Chinese vehicle. The Americans say that they were astounded 
by this growth, this surge in Chinese capabilities, which was underestimated and unsuspected. One has to wonder whether the reason why the Chinese were able to test a vehicle, this vehicle, so much sooner than the Americans suspected, is that the Russians perhaps have transferred hypersonic technology, glide vehicle technology, to China. Now, I want to stress, I have no way of knowing whether or not this is the case. And one must not assume that China does not have the capabilities of developing such a vehicle by itself. However, it's not inconceivable, given the extent of military cooperation between China and Russia at the moment. As I've discussed in recent programmes, in a military exercise in August, the Chinese shared technology, or at least out allowed access to the Russians to technology uh, uh, involving their J-20 stealth fighter. And they have also recently, um, in a naval exercise, provided the Russians with tech access to classified information about their Type 055 super destroyer. I want to stress that these are classified technologies. The J-20 and the Type 055 are top-of-the-line Chinese military systems. Possibly, just possibly, what we are seeing here is just the tip of the iceberg of military technology cooperation between these two great powers. Just possibly, the Russians are sharing hypersonic glide vehicle technology with the Chinese, and the Chinese, in return, are providing the Russians with, ex with um, um, access to Chinese technologies of their own. I want to stress, this is mere speculation on my part, and I want to repeat again that I have no doubt at all that China, sooner or later, would have been able to develop a hypersonic glide vehicle on its own, without any Russian technological input, and quite possibly it has done so. I'm only guessing, I don't know, but the possibility must be there, and the question must be there in the Pentagon's mind. There is no hint of this anywhere in this article, but I am sure that the US intelligence community, the US defense establishment, the Pentagon, are now agonizing and worrying and guessing and talking to each other about whether or not the Russians are indeed sharing such advanced technology with the Chinese. And they must also be worrying and stressing and becoming alarmed about whether this surge in silo construction in China has some connection to the test of this hypersonic glide vehicle. Now, I want to say again, I know there's been much commentary and indeed ridicule of the suggestion in alternative media that these silos are indeed part of a program by China to enhance its strategic missile deterrent. I know some people have claimed that they're either dummy silos or alternatively, that they are, in fact, something which the United States military industrial complex is itself misrepresenting in order to justify more spending on its own programs. All I would say about that is that the Chinese themselves have not specifically denied the existence of these silos and have made no comments about them and have not discussed their purpose. In fact, they've left the question of these silos open, but they have openly said and admitted that they are working hard to enhance their nuclear deterrent capability, and they've also linked the development of their nuclear weapons capability, the development of that nuclear weapons capability, with their determination to achieve the unification uh, of China with the island of Taiwan. So I personally would hesitate to discount 
the possibility that these silos actually are precisely what the Chinese say they are, part of the development of a Chinese nuclear deterrent of which this hypersonic glide vehicle is another component. And of course, it's also the case that over the last few mo weeks and months, we've suddenly seen an urgency in US moves, uh, diplomatic moves. We've seen the United States, President Biden specifically, telephoning Xi Jinping of China, trying desperately to uh, arrange some kind of a summit meeting with him, either an actual summit meeting or a virtual summit meeting. We've seen that the Chinese have played a long game. They've not rejected the idea of a summit meeting entirely, but they are not agreeing to it either. And we've also seen that there was a meeting in Zurich between the Chinese and the Americans, between Yang Chi who is uh, um, President Xi's national security advisor, and Jake Sullivan, who is President Biden's national security advisor. And I discussed how that meeting ended in total deadlock. And we've seen renewed efforts by the United States to try to open or reopen lines of communication to Moscow. A major effort to try to get Victoria Nuland to Moscow, an attempt to get her speaking to the Russians, various meetings arranged with all kinds of Russian officials, Dmitry Kozak, the uh, um, deputy head of Putin's uh, presidential administration, Sergei Ryabkov, a, a, a Russian deputy foreign minister, Yuri Ushakov, one of Putin's top foreign policy aides. And we've seen how the Russians have made it absolutely clear that the talks between Newland and the Russians ended in complete deadlock. And I've covered these discussions and negotiations in recent videos, and I've pointed out how both the Zurich and the Moscow talks went badly. Well, is it not at least possible that the reason for this renewed diplomatic effort by the United States over the last few weeks and months is alarm? by these Chinese hypersonic missile developments, that the, Rus that the United States is now worried that it is in danger of losing its nuclear superiority over China, that it finds itself tied down in uh, arms control treaties with the Russians that require it to negotiate on an equal basis on strategic arms with the Russians, and that the true purpose of Victoria Newland's visit to Moscow was to try to get the Russians to shift on this. And I remember how there was this um, meeting, this, this readout of the meeting with Ryabkov, in which the Russians said that, uh, this is a Russian readout, in which the Russians said that as far as they're concerned, they're only prepared to negotiate with the United States on a basis of equality and equal consideration for their interests. And of course, that is precisely what the United States does not want, because any treaty between Moscow and Washington that puts Washington in an equal position to Moscow in terms of strategic weapons means that the United States is in danger of losing its position of nuclear uh, weapons superiority against the combined forces of China and Russia. So one can understand American concerns and American alarm. But there is another aspect of this, and here we come back to a further point about this Financial Times article. It says that this hypersonic glide vehicle operated at a speed of Mach 5, which is slower than ballistic missiles can operate. Well, I believe that is true, but I also believe that this hypersonic uh, glide vehicle, like all other hypersonic glide vehicles which have been developed or are in the process of development, can certainly fly much faster than this. Its speed is not Mach 5. It is, I suspect, more close to Mach 11 
or perhaps even faster. Certainly reports I have seen about the Russian avant-garde hypersonic glide vehicle, which I would reiterate is already in service, put the speeds it achieves at, at Mach 11 or faster still. Anyway, the article then goes on to say, this is the Financial Times article, uh, uh, it reads as follows, Taylor Fravel, an expert on Chinese nuclear weapons policy who was unaware of the Chinese test, said a hypersonic armed ve glide vehicle armed with a nuclear warhead could help China negate U.S. missile defense systems, which are destroy designed to destroy incoming ballistic missiles. Hypersonic glide vehicles fly at lower trajectories and can maneuver in flight, which makes them hard to track and destroy, said Fravel, a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Fravel added that it would be destabilizing if China fully developed and deployed such a system, but he cautioned that a test did not necessarily mean that Beijing would deploy the capability. Well, I would say here that it's fascinating how the United States always regards deployment of military systems by its opponents as destabilizing and how American officials or, or, or commentators sometimes doubt that weapon systems de designed and developed by its rivals will actually be deployed. I cannot imagine that the Chinese, having developed this system, don't intend to deploy it. But anyway, let's move on. Mounting concerns about China's nuclear capabilities come as tensions between the United States and China have risen. Um, and last month, Fra Frank Kendall, US Air Force Secretary, hinted that Beijing was developing a new weapon. He said China had made huge advances, including the potential for global strikes from space. Now, I'm going to add something else here, which is, of course, that hypersonic glide vehicle technology can be used to develop intercontinental weapon systems, missile systems, capable of striking at the continental United States as the Russian avant-garde system, which, as I stress again, is currently de in deployment, can do, and as this Chinese system is intended to do, but the same technology can be scaled down and can be used for other purposes also. And in fact, here the Chinese have displayed small hypersonic glide vehicles, which appear to be intended to strike at US carriers. Now, given that this technology either exists or is being developed, one does have to wonder about the survivability of US Navy carriers anywhere close now to China's coasts or indeed anywhere in mid-Pacific ranges. Because, of course, if the Chinese do develop an anti-ship capability using hypersonic glide vehicles of this nature, then they could launch them from their ballistic missiles in China themselves, itself, and they could target them at Chinese, at US Navy carriers. There are many unanswered questions about this possibility. It's not clear, for example, how you control or correct the direction of a hypersonic glide vehicle if it is indeed targeted at a warship. But there are suggestions that this can be done, and there are rumours that both the Russians and the Chinese have somehow achieved this capability. If so, then it makes the entire US Navy uh, position in mid-Pacific extremely precarious, to put it mildly, given US dependence on US Navy carriers. So this is a game changer. Uh, and of course, if it also highlight, highlights a um, defense um, arrangement, uh, a defense technology uh, transfer arrangement between Beijing and Moscow. It is a, an extremely alarming one. 
one which is must be causing enormous concern in the Pentagon. And then there is, lastly, the last point I'm going to make about this Financial Times article. Going back, it says that the US, China and Russia are all developing hypersonic glide uh, hypersonic systems. I said that the Russians actually have not only uh, have not only developing such systems, they've actually deployed them. But it's clear from this test that the Chinese are ahead of this of the United States in hypersonic glide vehicle technology. And of course, the Russians are far ahead of the Americans in this technology, having already deployed a system of this sort. So it's also the case, as President Putin of Russia recently said, that for the first time since the Second World War, the United States is falling behind its rivals in the strategic weapons technology race. And that must also be extremely alarming to the Pentagon. So what does the United States in this kind of situation do? Obviously, there is a situation looming on the horizon where China and Russia, in aggregate, have more nuclear systems than the United States does. And the United States has to make a decision whether it moves out of arms control, uh, um, out of arms control treaties with Moscow, whether it abandons arms control with Moscow in order to try to compete with the Chinese and the Russians simultaneously, uh, confronted as it would then be by the fact that the aggregate technological, industrial and manufacturing capabilities of the Chinese and the Russians exceed its own it would then find itself, as I said, in a potential nuclear arms race, which it might actually be in danger of losing, and in which case it could find itself in a position of inferiority. Or does it try to come to some kind of a compromise with these two powers? And I discussed this many times in many programmes, and I've spoken about how the Russians have now repeatedly said that they are prepared to work with the United States, provided the United States accepts Russian red lines. And the Chinese have also, in recent weeks and months, talked about the need for the United States to acknowledge and accept that the two countries are in what the Chinese like to call a stalemate situation. And China has also spoken about the need for a geopolitical ceasefire, an expression, by the way, which to my knowledge, I was the first person to coin way back in 2018. Well, in my opinion, the situation now makes it absolutely clear which way the United States needs to go. The Chinese and the Russians are each developing hypersonic systems and various other technologies like the Poseidon nuclear-powered submarine drone, the Burestvenik nuclear-powered cruise missile system, and these systems are coming very close to deployment. Both the Chinese and the Russians seem to be at least abreast of the United States in other types of technologies like lasers and all that sort of thing. And the Chinese and the Russians are ahead of the United States in hypersonic glide vehicle technologies and in the case of the Russians, in hypersonic anti-ship missile technologies, all of which put the United States' surface navy in considerable jeopardy. And the United States, as it has seen, as it has experienced, as a result of the Russian actions in April, where the Russians mobilised a force of perhaps 100,000 troops, perhaps more, in response to a military build-up in Ukraine and have recently carried out a major military exercise, Zapad 2021, in uh, Western Russia and in Belarus, the Russians have demonstrated that at least in territories close to their own borders, 
they now possess a conventional military superiority, which is growing. So what does the United States in this kind of situation do? Well, as I've said before, it accepts the Chinese and Russian red lines. The Chinese and the Russians have pitched their red lines at a point where the United States can accept them without seriously compromising its own core interests. That means accepting, for example, that Ukraine will never enter NATO or the European uh, Union. Well, that is the reality anyway, so why not just accept it? Um, Georgia too, I suspect, would have to be told that its aspirations to join NATO or the European Union are never going to be filled, fulfilled. That's also the case, so why not simply admit it? Uh, Moldova, I suspect, also. I suspect also that the Russians want American acknowledgement and acceptance that the political system in Moscow is out of bounds and that US interference in Russian electoral and political processes is completely unacceptable. Now, the United States has complained vigorously about alleged Russian interference in US domestic policies. It's provided, shall we say, arguable evidence that even such interference has happened. But if the United States complains about what the Russians allegedly do to the United States, then it can hardly complain if the Russians complain in turn about what the Americans actually try to do in Russia. And, of course, it also means that the United States must accept that Russian plans for further integration within the former Soviet space, the Eurasian Economic Community, the um, Collective Security Treaty Organization, all of that, that they should be allowed to proceed without further interference. And as for China, well, we know again what the Chinese want. They want an acceptance by the United States that the political situation that existed with respect to Taiwan before 20, uh, 2016, one whereby the United States actually accepted, in fact, as well as in symbolic language, that the one China policy was in effect, that it, it made it absolutely publicly clear that it does not support any Taiwanese move towards secession from China, and that it will no longer supply Taiwan with advanced military systems. If it returned to that position, and it, if it also withdrew its naval forces from the South China Sea and the East China Sea, where, to be straightforward about it, they have no place, then tensions with China would subside and the Chinese would accept a geopolitical ceasefire on those terms. Note that neither the Chinese nor the Russians are seeking sanctions or trade concessions from the United States in return for this geopolitical ceasefire. In both cases, the Chinese and the Russians are reorienting their economic and trade policies towards each other, towards building up Eurasia, towards developing the Belt and Road Initiative. They no longer intend to focus so much on trade with the West and with the United States. So, as I said, what the Russians and the Chinese are seeking is a geopolitical ceasefire, one which is pitched at ter on terms, which the United States, if it was prepared to take a realistic view of its prospects and its interests, it could readily accept. Now, the problem is that the United States is resisting accepting these uh, this kind of geopolitical uh, ceasefire with the Eurasian powers. We saw a series of aborted meetings between the United States and China, Chinese officials, 
over the course of this year, culminating in the debacle in Zurich, when, as I said, Sullivan and Yang Chi managed to disagree on pretty much everything. And we've seen a similar debacle with Newland's visit to Moscow, in which, again, the Americans found that the Russians were unwilling to move, to shift in any way from the positions that they are now taking. And we've also seen a powerful article published by Dmitry Medvedev, the deputy chair of the Russian Security Council, one which uh, you can see a discussion from me about on Locals, on our Locals channel, in which I point out that the Russians are now taking an utterly uncompromising position on Ukraine matters, One, an article which was clearly timed to uh, clarify and demonstrate that fact in advance of Victoria Nuland's visit to Moscow. So, given that this is so, the United States is clearly finding it very difficult to accept that it has to make these major concessions, major, I would add, principally in its own mind, and accept that the Russians and the Chinese have their red lines, that they are insisting on them, and that the United States is merely putting itself in a weaker and ever more dangerous position when it tries to push back and resist them. I would reiterate again a further point which I have made. This is that we are very much at this moment at the start of this process. The Russians have deployed their hypersonic uh, glide vehicle, the, um, the avant-garde. They have also deployed their, um, air, their aircraft-based um, uh, Kinjal hypersonic uh, missile, which is specifically designed to target ships. But these are only the start of Russian military, military technology developments, which will be coming on stream at an ever faster rate over the next few years. We're going to start to see many more Yas and M class submarines, for example, deployed in the Arctic and the North Atlantic and perhaps the Pacific before very long. These, war these submarines and surface warships like the Admiral Gorshkov class frigates and the Admiral Nikhimov class battle cruiser will be armed with Zircon uh, uh, um, hypersonic anti-ship missiles. Um, some of which, which have apparently a range of up to 1,500 kilometers. We've recently learned that the Russians are busy developing smaller hypersonic missiles for carrying for carriage on their tactical aircraft, including the new Sukhoi 57, a stealth fighter jet, which they are deploying, uh, that they are currently deploying. The first of these are now entering service with the Russian Air Force. All the indications are that the military balance in Europe and the North Atlantic is shifting against the United States. And of course, the Russians are supplementing all of these offensive weapons with defensive weapons like the uh, S-500 um, anti-aircraft, anti-ballistic missile system and the A-235 um, um, anti-ballistic missile defense system that is being that has been deployed around Moscow and apparently possibly other sensitive sites. And we see the same is now happening with the in the Pacific. We see the Chinese busy building aircraft carriers, probably almost certainly developing submarines of their own, but also forging ahead with uh, land-based ballistic anti-ship missiles these most likely will be carrying hypersonic glide vehicle warheads before very long. And we see that the Chinese are also busy building silos and have now tested a hypersonic glide vehicle for their intercontinental missile systems, which will be deployed soon. So the military balance is shifting against the United States, both in the Pacific and in the Atlantic, at the same time, developing 
building nuclear submarines together with the Australians isn't going to change that situation at all. I would add that I've now received information that the 10-year time frame that I mentioned in terms of building nuclear powered submarines in Australia, that might even be over-optimistic. Some people are saying that it would take at least 20 years before such nuclear-powered submarines uh, built in Australia were ever put in service and deployed. And that disregards the fact that there is considerable political opposition to this program in Australia itself. So the AUKUS program is not a solution to this problem, nor is the Quad. There have been tensions recently between India and China on the border. And, of course, the Indians have a fractious and difficult relationship with China, and at the moment, relations between China and India are very tense. But as I've discussed in previous programmes, it is all but inconceivable that the Indians, for all sorts of reasons, would want to go the full way and commit themselves to some kind of anti-Russian-Chinese alliance with the United States. Moreover, not only would such an alliance not serve Indian interests, it is debatable whether India anyway has the industrial and scientific and technological capabilities to balance out this enormous growth in Chinese-Russian military power that we're going to see over the next 10 to 20 years. Perhaps in 20 or 30 years' time, India will also be able to become a military industrial superpower such as the United States and China are, and to some extent Russia also is. But realistically, that is some time away and it doesn't solve the United States' immediate military problems. So the United States needs to decide that it's going to come, has to decide whether or not it wants to come to terms with the Chinese and the Russians soon. If it fails to do so, then it will find itself either facing a strategic crisis in five to ten years' time, or it will be pushed into making further concessions, more concessions, to the Chinese and the Russians in, uh, later than it would if it came to terms now. Looking at the situation today, what the Russians and the Chinese are seeking from the United States in terms of realist foreign policy is not unreasonable. Waiting longer, delaying further, all that that will do is guarantee that the price is going to become much higher. I'm going to finish this program by making one final observation. I started it by speculating about whether the Russians and the Chinese uh, might be cooperating on strategic weapons development and that that might explain the immense Chinese advances in hypersonic glide vehicle technology, advances which have alarmed the Americans in the way that they have. I said that I am only speculating, that I'm only guessing, that I don't know one way or the other. And I want to emphasize again that I fully accept that China has the technologists, the technology, the scientists, the industrial facilities, the laboratories to develop this kind of technology on its own. However, I am going to now state what is more than just a guess, what is an opinion. I believe that the Russians and the Chinese are indeed cooperating on strategic weapons uh, development and that this is precisely what explains why the Chinese have been able to develop this capability so much more quickly than the United States ex expected. Um, I think it is implausible that two countries that cooperate 
so extensively on so many other matters, and which, as I said, are increasingly providing the, uh, each, the other with details of their classified conventional technologies, are not doing the, sa the same in terms of strategic weapons developments. After all, the United States shares technology, with, including strategic weapons technology, with its ally Britain, and of course it's just entered into an arrangement to provide nuclear submarine technology to its ally Australia. So I cannot see why the Chinese and the Russians, given the mutual trust that now exists between them, would not be doing the same thing. If that is correct, and I am sure that it is, then we're going to see even more problems for the United States further down the line. Because at that point, and before very long, we're going to see Chinese S-500 anti-ballistic missiles deployed on the Chinese mainland, and they have apparently been developed precisely in order to defend the Chinese ma mainland from hypersonic missiles that the United States might develop. And we could also start to see the growing Chinese Navy and Air Force also deploying hypersonic missile systems uh, targeted against US Navy warships. We could indeed find ourselves in a situation where the United States could, in a relatively short time, find itself comprehensively outmatched in conventional weapon systems by a Chinese military equipped with hypersonic missiles at almost every conceivable level, in terms of its ground forces, in terms of its air force, in terms of its navy, in terms of its submarine force, all of this spreading at alarming speed. Well, I think that is something the Americans need to take away and think about, and I think they need to think about it carefully. As I said, at the moment, the Chinese and the Russians are pitching their terms for a geopolitical ceasefire at a, a reasonable level. The longer the United States delays, the higher the price will get. Well, thank you for joining me for this programme today. I look forward to you joining me for further programmes on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforou. Please also remember to check out Alex's channel. You'll find links below. Please also remember to come to our other platforms. You'll find a great deal of exclusive content that we are publishing now on Locals, on our, specifically on our Locals channel. you find our link below. You will find, for example, that I have discussed recently that extraordinary article uh, written by the Deputy Chief of Russia's Defence Council, the number two uh, in the Russian political hierarchy, Dmitry Medvedev, in which he talks about Ukraine and makes some really fascinating points, highlighting the hard line that the Russians are now taking on uh, Ukrainian issues. And you will also find um, lots of other exclusive content published by myself and by my friend and colleague Alex Christoforou. And also, you can also find there all sorts of commentaries, discussions, articles, posts, by our Duran community, which also publishes on Locals. And you can also find us too on our other platforms, on BitChute, Library, Rumble, Odyssey, and the rest. And also, most specifically, on the new free speech platform, SuperU. And you can also support us, if you wish to support us, via Patreon and Subscribestar. And please don't forget to go to our shop, buy the amazing things that you will find there, our amazing magic mugs, our tremendous uh, uh, sweatshirts, our hats. You see, I'm wearing all these things today. You can also find us wearing our long-sleeved T-shirts, our, 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 our hoodies, and all the rest. And last but not least, 
If you like this program, please remember to check to, to press the like button on this channel and please also check your subscription to this channel. I say that because some people I've noticed on the threads have been complaining about the fact that their YouTube subscriptions have suddenly ceased. Well, I can't provide any explanation for that. I'm sure you can all you all have your guesses, but certainly please remember to check your YouTube subscriptions. Thank you again for joining me today. I look forward to you joining me again soon and have a wonderful day until then.